Welcome, everybody, to our Sound for Video session. It's great to have you all here today, and we're happy to welcome back Michael Pedersen. Michael, thanks so much for joining us again. You're welcome, Curtis. My honor. And for those that missed last time's, um, first of all, I'd highly recommend you go back and have a look at it. Michael is the historian over at Sure Incorporated, so many of the kind of classic microphones that so many of us know about and many of us still are using. Um, Michael gave us a history specifically of the Shure SM7B. And back when we when we did that, um, I remember, Michael, you talked a lot about Ben Bauer, who yep. invented or you know designed and created the first Unidyne capsule. And so you contacted me again, um, been a few months ago that we did that, and we're ready to go into more detail. So I'm excited to, to hear a little bit more about Ben Bauer and some of his work. So with that, I think what we'll do is go ahead and pop up. You have some slides you've prepared here. Indeed. Anything else I missed before you want to before we we jump no, it's, in? I... It's 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 an amazing story. I think uh, all the viewers are going to really appreciate who Bauer was and and what he did for the world of audio. Awesome. Well, let's just let's do it. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about Ben Bauer today, but also explore what we call the lost lab notebooks. They'll become clear to you as we go through this presentation. <clears throat> If you don't know what the Unidyne is, there it is. Some people call it the Elvis mic. Some people call it the birdcage microphone. For many people in the world, it's just that image is a microphone. So it was the world's first cardioid microphone with a single dynamic element inside of it. It was introduced in 1939, April. And by 1952, only 12 years later, or 13 years later, it was so widely recognized that we ran this ad in the trade magazines. Now, interestingly enough, it's 84 years after its debut, and we still are manufacturing the Unidyne. In 2014, January, the IEEE awarded Sure a milestone, number 137, for the Unidyne microphone. Uh, milestones are given to people and inventions that changed the world in the 20th century and the 21st century. There's been less than 300 of get these given away, so they're fairly rare. But I truly believe thought the Unidyne was so important that it deserved a milestone. This is the milestone plaque that's on display at Shure headquarters in Niles, Illinois. Here's some other <clears throat> IEEE milestone awards from the 30s to give you an idea of what it is. Uh, probably for the folks here, the most interesting one, 1931, stereo sound reproduction. That was for Alan Blumline. That plaque, by the way, is mounted on the wall of Abbey Road Studios uh, in London. There's also two-way radio police communications. There was the breaking of the Enigma code. And at the very bottom, you see for 1939, the single element unidirectional microphone. So to have these as our neighbors is pretty uh, pretty important to us. So... That's the IEEE Milestone Awards. By the way, you can look that up online and see all the Milestone Awards if you just do IEEE Milestone. So, Ben Bauer <clears throat> invented the uniphasic principle. That's the acoustical ne network inside of the Unidyne microphones. And he created this concept when he was only 24 years old. Now, I started at Sure at 24 when I was 24. And believe me, I didn't do anything like what Ben Bauer did. So here he is, Benjamin Bauer. His Original name was Baumsweiger, and he's age 24 in this photo, and he's the creator of the Unidyne. Here is a photo taken at Sure Brothers Company. That's what we were called back then in 1937. Ten years later, he had risen to the vice president of engineering. That uh, was a pretty quick rise, and this is a 1945 photo. But it took him 17 years to get to the United States, and it began in, the, in Ukraine where he was born. So let's kind of just look at Bauer's early life. So, 1913, born in Odessa, Ukraine. At the time, like then, indeed like it is today, the Ukraine was involved in a war. And so at age 10, his family fled from Odessa to Poland, thinking it was going to be better there. But they, though Poland wasn't in a war at the time, they encountered a great deal of anti-Semitism in Warsaw. They were there for two years. At age 12, the entire family moved to London reason they went to London is they wanted to get into the United States, but the United States had immigration quotas then. So you, where they would go after uh, London was to Havana, Cuba. In the 1920s, the largest population of European Jews outside of Europe were in Havana, Cuba. And they were there waiting to get into the United States. Again, there was a quota. 
Only so many could come in, and Havana turned into the waiting place, the waiting room to get into the United States. Now, now he's age 12. At age 17, uh, he goes to New York City. He had some relatives there, and he attended the New York Electrical School and then Pratt Institute. And by the way, he went there also to learn English at the same time. It's now his fifth, fifth language. He's age 17, and he speaks uh, Russian, or I should say Ukrainian some Polish, French, Spanish, and now he goes to the United States to go to college and also learn English at, at the same time. Amazing person. So he did that for two years, got an associate degree, went back to Havana, Cuba, and he worked as a service engineer for two-way radio. Remember, two-way radio was a new technology in the 30s. Well, this wasn't enough for him. He wanted to get a full four-year degree, and so at age 21, he went to the University of Cincinnati to study to get an electrical engineering degree. Well, here is where fate took a turn. At the time, Schur was looking for co-op students. These were students that would work part-time at Schur and then go back to the university. And so our chief engineer, named Ralph Glover at the time, had graduated from the University of Cincinnati. He wrote a letter to his professor saying, you got any bright students down there that might want to be a co-op? And Professor Addison writes back, he says, yes, there's this one, he's a junior named Ben Baumsweiger, and he is heading his class. We think you should look at that person. Our entire history at Sure probably would be completely different if this letter had not been written. So at age 23, 1936, he begins working as a co-op student at Sure. Eight week at Sure, eight week at work school, eight work at Sure, eight work at school, and was being paid $15 a week as a co-op student. <clears throat> he's very bright, that's obvious. And at age 24, when he graduates from the University of Cincinnati with his degree in electrical engineering, he's hired by Sure as a development engineer for $25 a week. And here's a photo from 1937. There's Ben Bauer on the far right. He's still called Baumswagger at the time, but we'll just use Bauer for the entire presentation. And at the uh, far left and at the far right, the, the bald guy there, that's Mr. Sure. That's S.N. Sure, who started the Sure company. Now, as a development engineer at Shure, um, you have to keep lab notebooks. That still happens today. And that's where you write down ideas and concepts, and you actually put dates on those because that may be important for future patents. But Bauer lab notebooks, number one and two from the late 1930s and 40s, were not anywhere to be found. We have every single engineering lab notebook, but we didn't have the Bowers. And I didn't know if they were lost or stolen or whatever. We knew that they had to exist because our archive at Shure has other early work from Bauer. I'm gonna show you some things there. Here's his 1938 white paper for his colleagues explaining how a unidirectional dynamic microphone will work. So this was like a technical paper he wrote up to explain to the people who he was working with what he was working on. We have that. We have his first and second unidyne prototypes. We have his third and fourth unidyne prototypes, all from 1938, by the way. And we have his fifth and sixth unidyne prototypes. We have the original design prototype. Now, design prototype is how it looks, not how it operates, but how it looks. The prototypes are how it actually operates. But this is what the original Unidyne was going to look like. This is wood painted silver. We have this. We have a first production Unidyne element. This is the element that went into the very first manufactured Unidynes. We have a production die casting of the first Unidyne. You can see it's in perfect shape. This is the, what it, of course, ended up looking like. And we have a 1937 Oldsmobile grill that bears a striking resemblance to the Unidyne. So if you ever want to know what inspired the Unidyne, just take a look at that car. It's a 1937 Coupe 6 Oldsmobile. And on the right, and the two photos on the right are a grill that I bought off of eBay from a 1937 Coupe 6. And we mounted it on a base, and did a little restoration, and then we stuck uh, a Unidyne die casting on the top as a hood ornament. But you can't deny that's exactly what that microphone was based on. We have his 1941 patent, which is called Conversion of Wave Motion into Electrical Energy. If you look really closely there, I think you can see my, uh, my arrow, Benjamin Baumsweiger. He still had not changed his name or shortened his name to Bauer at the time. We have the 41 patent drawing from, uh, from that patent showing the Unidyne element inside. And here's Bauer's first Acoustical Society of America paper. By the way, he went on to become one of the presidents of the Acoustical Society of America. 
but it's called the Uniphase Unidirectional Microphones, and this is from 1941. But lab notebooks were missing. This drove me crazy. We had every other lab notebook. Well, here's what happened. September 2016, 60 years after Bauer left, we found his lab notebooks in an off-site storage warehouse. Julie Snyder, my colleague, and myself were out there. We were going to begin a project to investigate 500 banker boxes stored off-site that had not been opened since the 1950s. And we were not specifically looking for the Bauer lab notebooks. We were just going out to see if we could discard these things or whatever. And the second box that we opened had the lost notebooks in them. And as you can see by this next photo, we were very happy. So let's examine a selection of pages from the notebooks. Let's see what it looks like inside the notebooks. September 1st, 1936. So he is a co-op student at the time. And this is the inside front cover of his first lab notebook. His boss is Ralph Glover. We'll talk a little bit more about Ralph Glover because eventually Bauer takes over Glover's job. And the change of the name from Baumsweiger to Bauer was caused because the we were in the early 41, late 41, 42, we started doing a lot of work for the government, creating microphones and earphones for the military because, of course, World War II was nearly upon us. And every time the government agents came to the sure to see how we were doing, they would meet Ben Baumsweiger and he would be grilled. Baumsweiger, is that a German name? He eventually got tired of that and he basically shortened it to Bauer just so he didn't get asked that question anymore. Here's his first day at work. Look at that note at the top. It reads as follows. All entries, ideas, suggestions, etc., are author's original unless specific credit is given. BB, Ben Bauer. Uh, I think he knew he was a genius. So his very first assignment was a heartbeat microphone. And this was basically a, a microphone designed that you, to monitor the heartbeat so that it could be used for teaching medical students. They could hear what the, what the heart was sounding like. And then this teacher could lecture about that. And at the bottom, I like this. This is his critique to his boss. First day, introducing acoustic resistance in front of the instrument is not quite correct. Ralph Glover, Glover, his boss, had suggested this idea, and Ben was like saying, nah, that's, that's not going to work. First day at work. 1937, May 27th. This starts doing the math for the cosine microphone and the cardioid microphone. This fundamental research you see on this page led to the uniphase principle. You can look at the, uh, at the complexity of the equations. I cannot explain them to you. I'm not a math person, but this gives you an idea. Again, this guy is... Uh, well, see, I just turned 24 at this point. When I got to this page, um, and by the way, of course, I looked at all the, all the pages of the notebook. This stopped me cold because I recognized this diagram right here. This is the electrical equivalent of the acoustical network inside the uniphase. And it just stopped me cold when I got to this page. I got goosebumps. And he describes this. He says, the following arrangement seems to offer possibilities. Yes, it does. It changed the entire microphone world forever. His idea, though, was that the original uniphase network was going to be used in a crystal microphone, not a moving coil dynamic microphone, which is like a loudspeaker in reverse, but a crystal microphone. And a crystal microphone, instead of using a magnet and a moving coil, uses a thin sliver of Rochelle salt. And the sliver is about the size of your little fingernail. And one end is held down, and the other end is flexed slightly by the diaphragm, and that produces an output level. Um, maybe someday we can do a, a future seminar on crystal microphones because they are really fascinating. So the original Unidyne microphone was going to be a crystal mic. This is 1938, January 2nd. Now he opines or he basically offers the opinion that a moving coil dynamic microphone is preferred over a crystal. And just the quote at the bottom, says, this appears, thus it appears that the coil construction will be most advantageous. So these notebooks basically document everything he's talking about and researching every day and putting it down in words so that it could be used for patent purposes later. The notebooks explain why Unidyne prototypes one and two, as they are seen here, don't have a magnetic field. If they are a moving coil dynamic microphone, they must have a magnetic field. But I was very confused when I got to look at these prototypes up close. Why wasn't there a magnetic field on these? And the reason is he created the magnetic field by sticking a horseshoe magnet to the bottom or to the back. Now, back in the 30s, Magnets were expensive. Uh, in fact, if you find uh, 
loudspeakers from the 30s, and many of them have electromagnets on them, not permanent magnets, because permanent magnets were expensive. So rather than building the magnet directly into the prototype, he basically had an external horseshoe magnet, and he stuck it to the bottom. And you can see there's the prototype number one, and there's the drawing of the horseshoe magnet at the bottom. He also did that for prototype number two. This is prototype number two, and he stuck a horseshoe magnet to the back to power it up. Simple, elegant, that's Bauer. This is the first mention I've ever found of the 150 ohm standard now, which is used for low impedance. If you ask someone now, what's the impedance of your low, uh, what's the impedance of your low impedance microphone? They'll answer 150 ohms. Well, they had to start somewhere. Pretty much started with Bauer. He was doing uh, experimentation and he found that the 150 ohm resistance was just gave him what he wanted for a moving coil microphone. Here it is, uh, additional work on the Uniphase network, and the red arrow points to the letter D. The letter D is the distance between the diaphragm front and the opening at the rear diaphragm rear. This is standard term not terminology now. It was not standard terminology back then. Ben invented that. And he also mentions Hugh Knowles. I'm not certain if many of you know who Knowles is, but Knowles Electronics is a company, multi-billion dollar company that is the largest manufacturer of hearing aid microphones and other tiny microphones for lots of applications. And at the time, Hugh Knowles worked for sure in the 1930s and 1940s. By the way, uh, Knowles Electronics is headquartered about 20 miles from where Shure is in Chicago. Now we're up to May 1938. Here's the unidirectional dynamic cartridge. And you can see now it's starting to take a point. There's the diaphragm here. There's the gap. There's the voice coil, and this is showing now he's starting to finalize what the Unidyne is going to look like. And finally, September 29th, 1938, is when they filed for the patent, conversion of wave motion into electrical energy. That's a broad patent. It doesn't say microphone. It basically says, yeah, well, wave motion, which he means, of course, acoustical wave motion into electrical energy. So the patent was very broad, so it would cover other things besides microphones if required. He's not working only on the Unidyne, of course. He's working on other inventions. And this is from also May 38. Here's our early calculations for a controlled reluctance mic. A uh, controlled reluctance microphone, also known as a controlled magnetic microphone, has a stationary coil, a stationary magnet. And then what happens is that the diaphragm pushes on a little, lack of a better term, a little diving board made out of a ferrous material. And that the little diving board as it moves disturbs the magnetic field and that induces a signal into the coil. This type of controlled mi reluctance microphone is very, very durable and played a critical role in World War II for communication mics. So Bauer was working on things like that as well. He, can't, he was the first one to use the term super. You've probably heard of super cardioid microphones. Uh, it's a microphone with a tighter pattern than a cardioid. And he came up with the term super. Uh, we also tried ultra, but we stuck with super for some reason. So Ben was the first one who coined the term super directional or super cardioid. He also laid out the principles of beam type, highly directional microphones. Um, 78 years later, sure finally introduced it. Ben knew this was possible, but he just didn't know that we just didn't have the technology to do this. So this is the idea of using many, many, many elements, sometimes hundreds of elements spaced at different distances and turning them into, by combining them various ways mathematically, you get very, very, very tight patterns. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner here, this is a array microphone that sure makes above this. And without, a, you know, the easiest way to think about this is that it could, within milliseconds, create almost searchlight beams of very uh, tight patterns to, to aim at the people who are talking. I'll show you that on the next screen here. Here is Ben, and he's only done half the patterns, but sh showing you how they can get tighter and tighter patterns by adding more and more elements. Um, and I like to say this, the ancients keep stealing our modern inventions. We were so proud of this. This is really a cool product. And when I discovered this uh, in 2016, I went to the engineering lab, and, I, and I, hid, I, I hid the dates. I said, hey, guys, what are this? I said, oh, that's the array microphone. And I showed them the 1938 date, and they just, their mouths dropped open. So Bauer was way ahead of his time. How much materials in the NAB notebooks? 300 pages in the first book, 195 pages in the second book. And now they're all indexed, scanned, and they are secured in a locked uh, cabinet in my office. What happened to Ben? Well, he worked from at Sure 
um, until 1957. But in 1954, Shure and CBS became uh, started a secret collaboration to create a stereo phonograph cartridge that was going to be required to play the forthcoming CBS long stereo long playing records. So CBS was working on these long playing records, but they needed a way to play it. So Shure and, and uh, uh, CBS started this, again, this collaboration. That's how CBS met Ben Bauer. 1957, he had worked for Sure for 20 years, was vice president of sales, and he was enticed away by CBS to join their laboratories in Connecticut, and he became the lead in their acoustical and uh, audio and acoustical research team. 1978, he reached 65. That was mandatory retirement age at CBS. He had over 100 patents to his name, and literally a little more than a year later, he died of a heart attack age 65. What was his most important work? Well, he did a lot of research for the military, and much of it is still classified. I've never seen it. I only know it exists. But according to his sons, he felt that his greatest work was on working on sound buoys, which are devices that are dropped into the ocean to track the movement of submarines. So they track the movement of submarines regarding using sonar or acoustical uh, methods, and then send a electronic signal or a radio signal to planes overhead, so that's how they could track them. So he did a lot of work on sound of buoys, and he felt that was probably his most important work that he ever did. 2023, his unifase development is used in maybe pretty much every unidirectional microphone worldwide. The patent, of course, expired in 1958. So now you get almost any unidirectional microphone in the world, and it has some variation of the unifase network inside of it. So he really did change the world. All right, a little change of pace here. As I say, something now for something completely different. Let's look at some rare photos for all you Unidyne fans out here. We're going to go through these fairly quickly. So here is his Unidyne one from 1939. That's the large Unidyne. Some people call it the fat boy. We don't call it the fat boy, but that's the larger version of it. There's the logo that we used on it. This is a logo that was developed in 1936. And if you see here, these are sound waves here. And that's the sure S or a sine wave. And here's the voice coil of the microphone. If you rotate this around 180 degrees, then you've got a voice coil putting out sound waves. So it can be used for a earphone as well. We still use this logo and probably will continue to use it for as long as the company exists. Here's the Unidyne 1 model 556. The primary difference on this, this upper part is still the same, but this lower part has a shock mount in it, a vibration mount, which has got rubber in it and uh, a few other things to help prevent stand noise from coming up into the microphone. Here's a microphone from 1556 from 1949 that was survived a th uh, fire in Rita, Rita Theater in Longview, Texas. And they were so impressed when they got this out of the fire that it still worked, that they sent it back to Shure. We still have it in the archive. It still smells of smoke and it's still operational today. We went to the Unidyne 2, the smaller version, in 1951. Um, the primary reason on the smaller version was television. Television liked the Unidyne, but the fat boy was too large. And so we made a version that was about 66% of the time size called the Unidyne 2. Here it is, the model 55S. Very, very intelligently, S stands for small. That's all it stands for. But I want you to note the color of it. Note that blue screen color, the blue logo, and the blue badge, because that's going to come back later when I show you a later microphone. So here's a comparison of the size. The Unidyne 2 is on the right. The left, excuse me, the Unidyne 1 is on the right. And if we look inside, you can see that the diaphragms are the same size. They've just managed to, to make this smaller. One of the reasons we could make it smaller is changes in magnetic material. You could put a smaller magnet in 1951 that would still have the power of the larger magnet from 1939. The uh, 55SW came out in 1961. The primary difference on that is we added a switch. That's what the, so S for small and W or SW for switch, just an on-off switch on that. We did a blingy version, the gold version in 1967. Uh, problem with this was that you couldn't put a thick coating of gold on it because if you did, it would cost a fortune. So it's a very thin coating. They look great, but if you handle them a lot, the sweat and the salt in your hands wears off that gold pretty quickly. So this didn't stay along, stay around very long. We did what's called a PE version. That uh, stood for professional entertainer uh, version. And the SH meant we added an XLR connector. 
um, that, that was at H. I don't know why H stands for XLR. I have, I've never been able to figure that out, but that's what it is. So S for small, H for XLR connector. The other ones had Amphenol connectors, by the way, which were predecessors of the XLR. Uh, in 1989, we simplified the interior quite a bit. Um, it, and this is the what we call the Series 2. So now it's a 55SH Series 2. This is the inside. Same size, di same size diaphragm, but this is much simpler to manufacture. Here's the blue one I mentioned again. So in 2009, we brought out what's called a Super 55. This is a super cardioid. Uh, it's based kind of on the Beta 58 element, but we decided to go with the blue on this as an homage to the 1951 version, which was also blue. And I just happened to like that blue color a lot. And here, here's what it looks like inside of the uh, Unidyne 2 Super 55. We did a special edition in uh, 2010 called the BCR. It stands for Black, Chrome, and Red. A limited edition. I've seen these floating around. The biggest user of this is the lead singer for Metallica. Still uses this as his front mic, his main microphone on stage. In uh, the 75th anniversary, we brought back the Fat Boy. We had to go back and recreate all the tooling. All that tooling had been lost. So we had to recreate all the tooling, and we made 5,575 of these. And we call it the 55SF75. So 55 was for the model number, 75 was the 75th anniversary, and that's exactly how many we made. Um, I now see them going on eBay. They sold originally for $399, I think. And now just last yesterday, I saw one on eBay going for $1,200. We did a pitch, back, pitch black version, excuse me, in 2017. I think that's a pretty cool looking one as well. And there are thousands of people around the world who have tat, Unidyne tattoos on them. I do not have one, by the way. I worked at the company for nearly 47 years, but I don't have a tattoo like this. If you ever are bored, just look, uh, go to Google Images and write microphone tattoo, and you'll see page after page of Unidyne microphones tattooed on the people. Many, many famous photographs uh, of Sure products. This is where in the United States and Japan signed a peace treaty after World War II. Here is General MacArthur, and there is a Unidyne Model 55 there that was used to record and also for the PA system so everyone could hear what MacArthur was saying. Another very famous moment in history, of course, is Martin Luther King delivers I Have, I Have a Dream speech in 1963. There is the Unidyne there pointed out. This is the Unidyne 2, the smaller version by the Red Arrow. And Ben Bauer's said, son said this is one of Bauer's most... Uh, he was very proud of the fact that this was used for that very famous speech. There's a book out. Uh, the Sheree Unidyne one is featured in this book from the Yale University Press. If you love Art Deco, which I do, this is a great book. Art Deco Chicago, it's called. It uh, talks about all of the Art Deco designs that came out of Chicago uh, during the 30s. The building there is was uh, called the Palmolive Building. It still exists. It's really Art Deco throughout. So that's the front cover. And on the back cover is the Unidyne. Uh, that's the ISBN number. If you want it, uh, it's, a, it's a great book. It's, probably, it's a big coffee table size book, probably 300 plus pages. Wonderful photographs throughout. And there's about three or four pages in it dedicated to the Unidyne. All right, I'm going to slow down to here in just a second. Take a look at this. Take a photo of this. Write this down. If you want a, a history book about the Unidyne, it's about a 50-page book that I wrote which has the Ben Bauer story in it, <clears throat> and also photographs of the Unidyne and photographs of the prototypes and almost everything I covered in here. Uh, I did write the book, though, before we discovered the uh, lab notebooks, so that's not co co copied in this. But all you got to do is go to Google, <clears throat> excuse me, type in sure answer ID 2715. Sure space answer space ID space 2715. That'll take you to a page and you will be able to download a free copy of a 50-page book all about the history of the Unidyne. So let's kind of wrap this up here. Um, he developed so many things that the lab notebooks only, you know, we only touched on a portion of it. And it's really difficult to appreciate every electrical acoustical breakthrough that Concept Bauer docu had documented in those first eight years, I'm sure. It's just amazing. You read through this thing and the guy had a new idea every day. Ideas about microphones, idea about uh, a, a transducer that you could put on the side of a of a large dam, and it could um, figure out how much pressure was on the other side of the dam. 
He also did things with camera lenses. This guy just had more ideas than he could possibly stick a sh st shake a stick at. Final note, the industrial design of the Unidyne, what it looks like, it's a registered worldwide trademark of sure. So we are constantly trying to defend that. Um, recently, we actually shut down Ikea. Ikea had printed images of the Unidyne on some pillowcases and had not asked our permission. And they were charging more for the pillowcases with the Unidyne on than for pillowcases without the Unidyne on. Therefore, they were making money off of our trademark. And it took a while, but eventually Ikea said, oh, yeah, I guess we better stop doing this. So my, my quest to you is if you ever see things which are being, uh, we have images of the Unidyne uh, and they are not from sure or whatever, send me an email and I'll be very happy to turn it over to Sure Legal. We would appreciate that. So with that, Curtis, um, I'm going to open it up to questions or comments or observations. It could be about the Unidyne, it could be about Bauer, it could be about all things Sure. And if anyone wants to email me uh, with a question later, there is my email, M at sure.com, M at sure.com. All right, Curtis, back to you. I'm going to... Thank you so much, uh, Michael. So we've got a lot of sentiment along these lines here. Uh, thank you for highlighting Sure History. Learning after the pioneers in audio helps me understand the fundamental principles and use our modern equipment even better. Keep it up. Good. That's a good one. They're doing a question here. I don't know if you have insights into this, but what mic technologies was Bauer working on just before he left Shure? He was more, he was working primarily on um, phonograph cartridges. Um, in the in the fifties and the sixties, Shure was primarily known as a phonograph manufacturer um, as opposed to a microphone manufacturer. He had done some uh, some some groundwork on what became the Unidyne Three which is the SM57 and the SM58. But that was primarily being done by a guy named Ernie Seeler, who was a, a student, quote unquote, of Bauer. He had come to work to Sure in 54. Bauer had taken him under his wing, given him some ideas, and, and then Ernie took the unit MP and ran. Um, so it was primarily phonograph cartridges. And I think he did a little bit of work on rib some ribbon microphones. Um, he did some work also on ceramic microphones, uh, which ceramic microphones replace crystal microphones. The problem with crystal microphones is it's a salt. And so if it gets wet or too humid, it stop, stops working. Whereas ceramic came out in the early 50s, which did exactly the same thing, but wasn't susceptible to humidity and, and uh, heat and so forth. So he did some work on that as well. But he was a genius. Unfortunately, I'd never met him, unfortunately. I, I met his son's. Um, uh, and they talked a lot about his dad, but I never met Ben Bauer, which really is sad. Heart, heartbreaking, yes. Yeah. Um, curious, when Ben arrived at Shure, what was Shure's primary business then? What were they producing at that point? It's a good question. Um, from 1925 to 1930, we were a distributor of products. We didn't manufacture anything. We distributed primarily parts to make radios. So you would come to us as a hobbyist and you would buy your cabinet and you would buy your loudspeaker and you would buy your vacuum tubes and so forth. And Mr. Sure got interested in microphones at the end of the 1930s because you could buy radios pre-made. So the parts business started to shrink. Ah. So, yeah. So he saw that microphones were going to be needed because these are all new technologies circa 1930. Um, Electronic recording as opposed to acoustic recording. That was new. That required microphones. Mm -hmm. Two-way radio, which I've mentioned, that required microphones. Um, there was also public address systems were, were, were becoming popular because they could make them smaller and cheaper. And so he saw all, and radio stations, just, you know, like the number of radio stations. So he saw a need for microphones growing, and he found a small company in Chicago called Ellis Electrical Laboratories. Mr. Ellis, Mrs. Ellis, and their son were building high-quality microphones in their house <laughs> and needed distribution, which Mr. Sure offered. So he started distributing microphones from the Ellis microphones and then decided to start making, making his own. So by Ben joined in 1930s, then we were making our own condenser mics, carbon mics, and crystal mics. Uh, we also made some electronic stethoscopes, interestingly enough. Hmm. Uh, but we didn't make our first phonograph product until 1937. So when Ben joined in 1936 as a co-op student, we were primarily a microphone manufacturer just starting to dip our toes into phonograph cartridges. But Ben okay. changed everything for us. 
Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, amazing yeah. guy. Um, I don't know if you have some input on this, but you talked about amphenol, amphenol, amphenol yep. connectors yeah, versus amphenol. XLR. Yep. yep. How so? So were those balanced connections as well, or was yes. that what? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what? Well, what's uh, the difference, and why standardized on XLR? So amphenols, uh, amphenols started to be used micro. By the way, in the 1930s, there were no standards on, on connectors. I mean, RCA had their own. Everybody, it was busy. It was it was wild, wild west. Uh, and a lot of the microphones were indeed unbalanced because they were they were high impedance. They're going into a tube amplifier, so you really couldn't have a very long cable. But the dynamic microphone, like the Unidyne, could be low impedance and balanced. So the amphenol connector was pretty nice really it, it was, it's very much like an xlr connector except it doesn't have the switch the quick disconnect so with an all you plug it in and then there's a circular ring that you you twist to thread it to the microphone so the it was yeah and there's nothing wrong with an amphenol connector it really worked quite well so that was standard on sure products till the late well actually the, the first xlr product we brought out was 1951. xlr by the way xlr was made by a company called canon not, not, the, not the photography people, a different canon, spelled like a canon, C-A-N-N-O-M. And it, when it first came out, it was called an X connector because they basically call their connectors A, E, C. <laughs> <laughs> and so they had just brought out the U, you know, you know W, X, Y, right? So, so they had just brought out the W connector, so X was next. So it was an X connector. The difference was you could get that disconnect that, the latch. Um, well, I, I take it back. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna contradict myself. Originally, it did not have have a latch. You just plugged it in. But they added the latch soon after that. That's what L stands for. So it's an X connector with a latch L. And then the R came because they added a rubber boot at the end to, for, and that was uh, for the um, strain relief. So oh, okay. X connector, okay. L for latch, R for rubber boot, and the. Broadcasters were the first ones to really accept it. And broadcasters like the XLR because you can plug it in and plug it out very, very quickly. It didn't yep. take as long as an Amphenol. Yep. So we made um, Amphenol microphones all the way into the 70s. And then mm -hmm. we eventually out of the Amphenol business. So for a long time, you go back and you, if you buy a vintage Sure mic, you better see what connectors are on there. Because <laughs> there was a third party making Amphenol connectors until two years ago. And now no Amphenol connectors are made anywhere. So the, I watched the prices on eBay in about a week, triple in price. Wow. So, wow. Uh, XLR's, a, XLR's a great connector. You know, so that's, that's, that's when the conversion happened around the 50s. But it took us nearly 20 years to get rid of all of the amphenols. I wow. Don't know if that answered so, Christopher question yeah. or not, but yep. definitely some good insight. Um, yep. That's so that's 70 some years now that are, you know, 70 yeah. plus years that we're looking at with that same, same standard. And it's a great, interesting. it's still a great connect. You know, yeah. it's yeah. Uh, no one ever, never, nobody ever gripes about the XLR connector. <laughs> that's not, that's not where the feedback comes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a, a nice little note when you're talking about tattoos, Eric says that if he was going to get a tattoo, he'd settle for the schematic of the Unidyne circuit, <laughs> which I think well, is a brilliant uh, idea. Eric, I, I, I was at an AES show, uh, I don't know how many years ago, and, and a guy walks up and he says, hey, I'm a big Unidyne fan. Want to see my Unidyne tattoo? I said, sure. So he shows me on his right bicep, he has a photo of the Unidyne. Left bicep, he had the polar patterns, and then he opened up his shirt, he had a frequency response on his chest. <laughs> oh my <laughs> that's I dedication went, wow that, that's a fanboy <laughs> <laughs> oh good stuff um, Diesel was kind enough to also repost uh, Sure Answer yes. ID 2715 for the for yep, the free book you. if you'd like to hear the whole you know get a little bit more story on uh, Ben and his developments here's an interesting question can you talk about the history and importance of neodymium yep. magnets in microphones yep. Uh, neodymium was, I, I can't tell you who created it, but one of the first uh, companies to use it was GM. GM used it in the 1980s to get more voltage out of their um, alternators in their cars. And so that's where they were first started using. And then we were slow to pick it up. The, um, it was Electric Voice that figured out. And, of course, Electric Voice is in Michigan, you know, closer to GM there. That, that could have been some cross-pollinization there. And Electric Voice came out with the neodymium. And the biggest 
you know, the b b biggest thing that uh, advantage to that is that you can basically put that into the, the same microphone, change it, and get about four dB more output because of the stronger magnetic field. So we were a little slow on that, and we started to lose sales to to their 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 they call them endyme. That's they shortened the endyme microphones in the uh, '80s, not because the microphone sounded anybody, but you could take a '58 and an endyme and talk them side by side, and the endyme would be hotter, be louder. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a fairly easy sale. And you know, hey, this is louder. I'm going to buy it. You know, probably not a good reason <laughs> to do it, but that's what happened. <laughs> So we decided to bring out our beta microphone and our beta 58 and our beta 57 were the first ones to use neodymium magnets. Um, and, you know, are, are they better? No, they're, they're simply louder. Uh, and we never made an SM58 um, with a neodymium in it because, you know, you don't mess around with Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got you. You know, is, remember remember new Coke, old Coke when they brought out new Coke. Oh yes, uh, and what a 80s? disaster that was, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to improve that. So you know, the '58 for us is such an important model that we don't change anything. <laughs> you know, so we just decided if we're going to bring out a neodymium version of it, it better be a completely different model number and everything. Um, some of your viewers may know that the the, the Beta 58. Uh, and the beta line has kind of like a, a, a gunmetal blue color on the handle, you know, as opposed to the gray panel. There's a, there's a fun story behind that. So when we were working on the design of the beta 58, what it's going to look like, we hired an outside designer who I won't say his name, but he was very famous. <clears throat> and one of the, one of the things he had designed was the bat wing, uh, the bat wing logo for Motorola, you know, that M bat wing mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Really, but he had never done any any industrial design, so we hire him, and he comes in, and he's here's what the here's what the beta microphone is going to look like. And honest to God, it's a gray handle like the S58, a bright chrome ball grill that would be done nothing but reflect lights, and mm. around the ball grill he had put orange polka dots. Mm. Yeah, mm. <laughs> and. <laughs> And those of us say we, we just we look at this in horror. It's just ugly, ugly. And so the president of Sure at the time said, "No, he's the designer. He's the expert. We're gonna we're gonna go with that." And so a few of us just begged and pleaded and said, "Could we take a few of these out and show them to sound engineers and see what they think?" Right. So we did, and they just laughed. <laughs> oh God, you guys are so funny. That's is this what a, what a great April Fool's joke. <laughs> Anyways, so. So the results were not very good. And I was a product manager at the time. I was a product manager for um, our mixer products. And one of the things that I had implemented on the front of our mixer products was this very thin blue stripe. And all mm -hmm. it was was just to kind of identify Sure products. If you saw a Sure mixer, if you saw a mixer had a blue stripe on it, it was a Sure mixer. Mm -hmm. So I, I suggested, I said, well, why don't we, maybe we can just re tie the microphones and the mixers together, replace those orange polka, polka dots on the equator with a blue band. So we started with that, and then we chose a color of blue on the handle to match that blue band, and that's how it came about. And and you also lost the extremely shiny chrome ball. It sounds yes. like no, too, which no, which, Curtis, actually, which, which TV but, I can't imagine TV would necessarily love that, right? I mean, that can no, mess with their wouldn't. lighting design. Yeah. If you go if you go back and you look at the first year we off, offered the Beta Fifty Eight, there was the matte grill and the chrome grill. Ah, okay. So there was there an are option. Some chrome, there are some chrome grills out there. Oh man, that was bright, you know. So, uh, and and believe me, within about a year, you know, we were selling a you know a, a thousand to one ratio, and the chrome grill went away very quickly. But there are some, yeah. unfortunately, a few of those chrome grills out there. But the okay. the orange polka dots. Oh man, I've, I've got that. We have that prototype in the in the archive. I I never pull it out unless I want to use it as a joke. <laughs> Good April Fools. Um material yeah. right there there you go yeah exactly. okay uh, another interesting question where does the pg48 mic fit into the overall the technology developments and the product line really yeah the the, the pg series was uh, per, pg stood for performance gear uh and really it was just a, a series of products that we decided to bring out that were less expensive than the sm mics to kind of get the first time performers um the acoustical 
aspects inside the PG are very similar as far as, you know, that uniphase acoustical network is pretty standard. Um, but it's got a simplified, ma simplified manufacturing. Um, it's just as durable. They don't sound quite as good. Uh, but really, the PG line more was a more marketing than it was engineering. Okay. It was to try to get something to a certain price point. So we had PG good, SM better, and then beta best. You know, that, that good, better, best is pretty much standard marketing no matter what. Uh, nothing, nothing unique inside the PG48. Nothing wrong with it by any means. Um, but, you know, it, you know, SM58 doesn't cost you that much more. And I would tell people, you know, well, you know, if you can afford a 58, if you get that, you probably won't need to buy another microphone for the rest of your career. Yeah. I, I bought my first 58 in 1971, still in the basement, still works fine. Yeah. Yeah. They're amazing. I mean, they're just so durable. Um, and they've, they've been, how long have they been priced at $99 US for the oh, non-switched for, version? Forever. <laughs> forever, it seems uh, like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. how do we keep it there? Well, it's it's volume for us. I mean, you know, it, yeah. it seems like every year we sell more 58s than we did the year before. It was not a by the way, Curtis, it was not a big hit at first. It took about ten years to take off. Um, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, just I, you know, I, and normally I don't give out quantities, but this is so funny. I do bring it up. The first year of S and 58 sales, we sold 143. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way the to, to, year. to sink a company fast with uh, numbers like that. Wow. Yeah, 143. Yeah. And, and, it, and we didn't we didn't crack 1,000 a year until uh, almost 10 years later. Um, but one of the things that really, really helped us out was uh, there was a show, a TV show called The Midnight Special in the mid-70s. And it had all the hottest bands uh, on there. And they started using 58s. And then all, then Saturday Night Live started using 57s and 58s. And that exposure helped us a great deal. So, so interesting. Yeah, I was actually, yeah. now I watch um, old concerts. Last night I watched a, um, a couple of the acts from the um, 1985. Uh, what was the big concert at Wembley? Um, Oh, was that the uh, World Aid or, ba or um, yes, it yes, was one of those aid aid concerts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And mm -hmm. I, I saw Bono on stage from U two. I'm pretty sure that was an SM fifty eight, and I think he later went switched over to a Beta fifty eight. But yeah, um, they're just so or, so or recognizable. Roger, yeah. Roger, Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey has never changed off the fifty eight. Um, he's in fact we we have a fifty eight in our archive that belonged to Daltrey, all taped up, you know, because yep. we'd swing yep. his mics. And it was the only one that he had that ever failed. And he was just curious what, what happened. So he sent it back to us. We put it into our x-ray machines to figure it out because we don't want to disassemble it. We want to x-ray it. And we found out the problem was in the cable, the external cable. They had, they had crypted the external cable so tight that the cable broke. Microphone worked just fine. Interesting. You know, so so yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, he, so he, he, he let us keep it. He says, you know. You guys want it? Yeah, fine. Yeah, <laughs> I got so, my so I got my hundred dollars worth out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you mean I always, people always say this is a good microphone. I said, well, you know, here's a guy who could find you know he could afford any microphone in the world that he wants, but he yeah. uses it because he likes it and it works well with his voice. Yeah, it's always you know it's always to me it's not the price of the microphone; it's what works well for what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, let's see. Um, we have a couple of questions, but they. So let me just. I didn't. I didn't uh, let everyone in the audience know. Michael is can't really talk about future products or anything in the future for a couple of reasons. Number one, that's not his area with insure, and number two, right. yeah. that's not how companies generally operate anyway. I would, but... I would lose my job so quickly. I mean, are they are they general are they general things or what? Well, I mean, here for example, uh, re-release a black and red version. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually. I, I don't know about that, but I will. I will tell you this: is that you know, um, we do listen to what people have to say. Now they probably won't listen to me, but if you want, if you want to send a note to like, I think it's called. It's either like info at sure dot com or sales at sure dot com, saying, mm -hmm. "Hey, I really love that black and red version. Why don't you recreate it?" I mean, if we get enough people asking for stuff, they'll typically would do that. Um, okay. spe other special com color combinations, not that I'm aware of, but we, I'm, I can't imagine that we won't. Uh, I, I haven't seen anything float floating around recently, but send a, send a note to info at sure .com and Say, hey, please release this. You get enough enough people asking for it, they'll they'll think about it. There you go. There you go. There's a tip for you. Uh, note yep. here that SM58 
equals Coca-Cola, um, basically, except that, except that Shure was smart enough not to do a new SM58, which is good. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, what we just really, you know, everybody's talking about sustainability, right? These days, you know, well, are your products sustainable? I think that, how about making products that you, you buy once in your lifetime and you don't have to replace ever? I mean, that's yes. really kind of the ultimate sustainability. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's not like, oh, my, here, you know, my, this thing's two years old. I got to throw it away, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm quite proud of Sure because of the fact that we do make products that you don't, in general, don't have to replace too often. Even though that's changing now with, you know, the more software you get in there, God, that's just really, you know, because all of a sudden you've got a chip there. Oh, we don't support that chip anymore. So you, you got manufacturers of chips who pull that on you. We, we typically don't use the most up most latest chip because it doesn't have a track record mm -hmm. and we don't want to be making a product that someone's going to fail, you know, during the major concert. So we wait the things kind of settle down, but we're running into situations now where chip manufacturers saying, Oh, that chip there. Well, you know, that's five years old. We can't use that anymore. And then that puts us in the bind. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that on my, um, some of my other products, I won't name names, but I have a digital mixer that, uh, I keep seeing firmware updates. So I bought it when it was brand new, when it first was released, mm -hmm. probably five years ago now. And as they release new firmwares, they're they're adding firmware because the newer iterations, the newer, the more recently manufactured are evidently using different chips. And so they have to release a new firmware just yeah. to keep it working the same way as the previous, which is interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. Interesting one, one of the things that we did that was really smart about, I don't know how many years ago, is we actually developed a chip specifically for wireless microphones. So the reason that, you know, that a lot of our wireless microphones now, the ULXD and Axiom Digital and so forth, are not being copied is because there's a there's a chip in there that it's ours, and so you know even if if uh, um, one of our competitors could reverse engineer all the software in there, they can't get the chip. Yeah, uh, and yeah. so that cost us that was that was that was multiple millions of dollars, but boy, has that paid us back well. Yeah, yeah, and also potentially um, help as far as. Uh, supply chain constraints because we're seeing a lot of that yes. in the industry right now too oh or, man you know so yeah i mean and, you know and for example we use a lot of the same chips that that apple uses or or the car manufacturers use. guess, guess yeah. who gets first choice exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly whoever's going to buy in the biggest volumes is who wins um, yeah, that's generally. exactly right that's exactly um, right I, I realize you can't probably answer this one particularly, but I'm curious if you have any insights into what you see on the horizon as far as just in very, very general terms, as far as. Yeah. Array microphones, like, array microphones are just astonishing. Um, the, it, it, you know, if people look at after we're done with this, look at the MX sure MXA 920 array microphone. What it can do is astonishing to me. I, I when I first heard we were going to do it, I was like, nah, that's impossible. <laughs> you know, physics won't allow that. But the idea of being able to use uh, multiple, you know, hundred, hundreds of chips, th th thousands of microphones that are, you know, smaller than your fingernail, uh, MEMS microphones, and then adding firmware and software that make them all talk to each other and do things like that is truly astonishing. Um, you know, I, we've got them now. I mean, we've got not only not only the MX920, but there's also uh, noise. There's no, noise cancellation that's on there that basically can model what's going on in your room and get rid of everything except the speech. I always thought that was impossible, and yet I'm hearing that now too. Uh, there, we have yeah. a demo now where there's one guy who's talking and he's cr he's crumpling a paper bag or crumpling a, a potato chip bag, and you can hear him talking. You can see him crumpling the bag, and you can't hear that bag. That to me is just I don't have any idea about that so i would say array microphones are, are going to be that but you know as far as new actual new ways to transduce the signal as far as taking the acoustical signal and turning it into electrical signal i don't see anything new on that that's pretty yeah. much all, all established we thought laser microphones were going to be something you know where you have a, a diaphragm and you bounce a labor laser off of it and it can measure like you know millions of an inch it, it just it never panned out to be anything it's not any better than a dynamic microphone or a condenser mic. Yeah, sounds like, I mean, it sounds like an expensive way to achieve the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So interesting, interesting stuff. Okay. Um, all right. Here's a little note here from Christopher. I still have a first gen hardware ULX, ULDX. ULX, mm -hmm. yep. It's ULXD, isn't it? You, no, ULX. yep. U U ULXD. Yep. 
Okay. 12 yep. years old, you'd hard, hard pressed to know it isn't brand new other than a few scratches on the transmitters. Yeah, that's, keep, that's the idea. Keep, yeah, keep take care of these things, you know? If you take care of them, there's just no reason they're not going to work. Now, the problem, of course, with all the wireless stuff is we never mm. know what the FCC is going to do to us, right? right? Right. And the FCC is going to say, oh, I know we promised you those <laughs> those frequencies, but now these, this company is going to offer us $2 billion for it. So, you know, no good for that. But yep. Yep. The other, there, there's something interesting now I'll, I'll, as far as hindsight goes. So when we brought out our first wireless microphone in 1953 called the Vagabond, all the Vagabond was trying to do was replace 20 feet of cable mm -hmm. or 30 feet of cable. That was all it was trying to do. And then, of course, as wireless microphones got better and better and better, we got lazy. Well, let's replace 200 feet of snake cable with a wireless microphone instead, right? Uh, and now, with all the technology, all the wireless stuff going like that, we're getting back to what had happened in the beginning. In fact, we just brought out a, a system now called GLX, GLXD Plus or something like that. I'm sorry. It's something like that, GLXD Plus. And what we say is put the receivers on stage. You're back to yep. <laughs> just replacing that short cable ring rather than trying to replace the long cable run. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, what the amount comes around. The amount of our radio frequency <sighs> in a stadium at a concert has got to be unreal. I just can't even imagine what it's yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and that's why our Axiom Digital has worked out well because that can like pick up interference and in a split second change the transmitter and change the receiver to something that's open. Yep. You, yep. you almost have to do that now. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, if you if you take care of our, you know, we, we, we build durable stuff because we learned how to do that during World War II. And if you take care of our stuff, you don't need to buy anymore. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see, let's see, what's this one here? What's the difference between SM57? Oh, I think the maybe asking between 57 and 58? 58, right? Maybe, yeah. I'm not sure uh, what Joe meant. It, it, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll make the assumption uh, that it's, 5758 the ball grill <laughs> that's that's it. all that's all that's it, you know what though i will say this um having both and putting them yep. side by side for spoken word audio yep. they sound they sound different to me um well the grill does do something i yeah. mean you have to realize they're not they're, they're not the, they're not the same but the ball grill is different the, the the grills are slightly different. They will they will change the acoustics slightly, but that's the only difference is the grill. Will that affect the sound somewhat? Yes, but the only physical difference is the grill. So interesting. <laughs> yep. I mean, you know, you might, think about think about this, Curtis. The diaphragm of a microphone moves millionths of an inch. Yeah. Therefore, little tiny changes can affect that millionth of an inch movement very easily. Yeah. And so placement within the body, the grill itself, all these things can have an, an effect in the, in the overall sound that you get right. in the end. Yeah. So look, 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 at the, look at the mesh on the top of Nesta 57 and see how fine that is. Yeah. And then look at the mesh on the grill. It's not nearly as, it's, you know, it's not as fine as a grill. So that coarse mesh versus the fine mesh makes mm -hmm. a difference. Yeah. Interesting. So interesting. And actually, Joe confirmed for us. That's exactly what he was asking. Yeah. 57 and 58. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, here's a question. Do you give public tours of the museum? <sighs> well, <laughs> we're, we're a working facility, and therefore, it's not really like a public um, place to visit. Now, do we give tours? Yes. Typically, you have to be related to the industry in some way. Um, dealers, for example. Uh, we'll do things for some journalists and so forth, but it's not the type of place you can just show up and say, "Hi, I'm a big fan," which we appreciate, you know, like that. <laughs> and I, I, I'd like to get a, of the tour of the place because we simply just, just don't have the time. Um, yeah. And you know, when 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 even when journalists come in, sometimes we can't show them areas. We're working on something private. Um, the, the test facilities are in use and so forth. So. Um, I, I guess I would have to say, in general, no, we don't do public tours, and sorry about that. But on the other hand, I'm happy to answer any type of questions that you've got. You know, you, you got my email, petteram at sure .com. If You have specific questions. I, I promise you that if I'm at work, um, you will get an answer from me, even, even if it's saying I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes I, I have to say that. Absolutely, good, good. All right. Michael, thank you so much welcome, uh, for coming You're back to, to tell us a little bit more about the microphone development process, specifically Ben Bauer. Fascinating 
information there. Yeah, uh, he's a great guy. Great, great stuff. And thanks to everyone for the questions and engagement. We love uh, being able to do this together. So with that, everybody, get out there, make some great sound this week, and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody. We'll see you. Bye-bye.